Britain's ruling Conservative Party appear to be heading out of office. Trailing massively in the polls, they've just suffered two humiliating by-election defeats. But has holding on to the seat of former leader Boris Johnson shown them a path to retaining power? Welcome to the programme. I'm Philip Hampshire. Losing two parliamentary seats in the same day doesn't happen very often. And the Conservative Party didn't just lose them, their vote collapsed. But against expectations, they retained one seat by campaigning hard on a local issue. So is this the way forward for them? Not since 1968 has a serving Prime Minister lost three by-elections in one day. So Rishi Sunak will be thankful to have not joined that club. He'll also be keen to gloss over two really humiliating defeats, one to Labour and one to the Liberal Democrats, where huge majorities were overturned. Instead, he'll try and focus in on the Conservatives retaining the London seat of Uxbridge and South Ryslip, former constituency of Boris Johnson. But their success there wasn't a ringing endorsement of Rishi Sunak. The victory was sealed by a targeted attack on a local policy being implemented by a Labour London mayor, albeit one developed by the former mayor, one Boris Johnson. It's not the first time the plan has worked. Focusing on a coalition of chaos and getting Brexit done brought them electoral success in 2015 and 2019. So is this the way forward? Joining me in the studio, we have Claire Pearsall, who is a former special advisor at the Home Office when Theresa May was Prime Minister. We also have Benedict Spence, who's a political commentator. Meanwhile, in Spain, we have Nick Dubois, who's a former Conservative MP. He also served as a special advisor to the former Brexit Secretary, Dominic Raab. Claire, let me start off with you. OK, I'm going to show throw you a really <laughs> simple, easy one here to start with, which is three elections, Conservatives won one, they lost two. Is that a good result or not? What a loaded question that is. It's a tough one. It is a tough one. Um, I think that the result was better than expected. Most people thought that we were going to lose all three. So to maintain one, I think, was a bonus. It was solely on one issue which the Conservative Party were very, very good at campaigning, and the Labour Party, not so much, which is the ultra-low emission zone brought in by uh, Sadiq Khan and looking to be expanded. So I think that is an answer for, for that. The rest of the country, I think there's an awful lot of protest votes going on. I don't think you can extrapolate that out to what a general election would be. So at the moment, I think that the party will have to reconvene, have a look at what was going right in those seats, why did our vote not turn out? What could we do better? And then we can start to form a plan for the election. Benedict. I think it's a little academic to say that it's a better result than anybody was expecting. It's like if you've lost 2-1 rather than 3-0, you've still lost. You've still not got any points. It's, it, 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 the fact of the matter is Ulez is quite a, you know, a, a specific issue. It's not something that can be replicated uh, outside of certain seats. And frankly, it's not necessarily the sort of thing that might even play a part at a general election. It's just something that at the moment has caught a lot of people's attention. And I think, broadly speaking, the Conservative Party doesn't really know where to stand. You know, this is one area, Eula, is fantastic, that it's sort of latched upon to and gone, oh, maybe, maybe the public in general aren't as keen on environmentalism as once we thought. But I really don't think that you can take that from just one seat. And were they to go down that road, sure, maybe some seats uh, might be a better place to be retained or won at the next general election, but they would lose others. Others would go very heavily in the other direction. So there isn't one sort of silver bullet that they can sort of land on and go, yes, this is the thing that's going to row it all back for us. Um, there are just too many myriad different issues affecting too many different areas. I suppose the plus point here is there is nothing really for the Labour Party to sort of just define their campaign through right now. That's why I think they haven't quite been able to grab the public's attention and imagination as they might have hoped, uh, because there isn't something that people look at the Labour Party and go, yes, absolutely, that's why I'm voting for Labour in the next general election. They just vote for them right now because they're not the Tories. And that's the same with the Lib Dems. Ultimately, you can't really build a particularly strong coalition with that. Lots to unpack there. Nick, let me bring it across to you. 
with the result being one win, two losses, do you think that was a good result? Do you think it was a bad result? It's a very loaded situation. Uh, actually, I, I mean, it was a bad result because I think if you take uh, all three, the bottom line is if I was back in the House of Commons now, I'd be walking, walking away having examined those elections saying to myself, uh, so many Conservative voters uh, stayed at home. And what's not clear from polling is just how many of those are going to come back. Quite a few are going to come back. The question is, how many? And, and it's quite clear they're going to break in three or four ways. Uh, and that would suggest the Conservatives are going to mitigate their losses at the next election unless they can tap into what it is that kept Conservatives at home. And, and I would say this, that it's principally and always going to be about the economy and how people are feeling. And why we did well in Uxbridge is there was a very easily identifiable problem, Ules, this, this, this charge to drive your car, that basically contradicted everything politicians are saying is, we know there's a cost of living. We know you're hard pressed. We're here to help you. We're going to sort the economy. And on the other hand, there was this attempt to whack on more prices on people. So the message that came back was, in many respects, yeah, a bit of protest about the green aspect of this. But you're screwing us at a time we do not need to be punished any more economically. Claire, Nick was saying there that um, one of the fundamental issues that the Conservatives faced in these by-elections was the Conservative voters stayed home. They didn't jump ship and vote Liberal Democrat. They didn't necessarily jump ship and vote Labour. They simply didn't go to the polls at all. Now, this is a by-election, and by-elections often have slightly lower turnout. Is that what everyone's going to pin their hopes on now, or is that a waste of time? I think you are being quite stupid to be blunt, if you think that you can get away with, oh, it was only a by-election, that's why they stayed at home. Given that we've had a set of local elections in May of this year where the results were, frankly, appalling, the Conservative Party lost uh, 1,063 councillors. Now, our own vote did stay at home, but those that did turn out voted against us. So I think it's a very lazy argument to say, oh, well, they were only local elections or they were only by-elections. You should be campaigning as if this was a general election. This should mean as much as a general election if you want Conservatives to be elected and if you want the Conservative Party to run the government in the future. Anything less than that, and I think you are wasting your time and you are taking the voting public for granted. OK, so if you're advising the Conservative Party right now, what do you advise them to do? How do you get out of this hole? We have here um, some, of the, uh, some of the details on the... Uh, uh, on the scale of the defeats that the Conservative Party had, all three seats were historically delivered to as Conservative wins, uh, but they lost convincingly with big swings in Somerton. It was to Liberal Democrats in Selby. It was to Labour. Uxbridge they held, of course, but that was only 495 votes. So what do you do to the Conservative Party to get them to win again? The Conservative Party need to come up with a, a set of proposals and policy ideas that are going to make a difference to people's lives in everyday part of their life. You don't need five slogans on a, on a chalkboard or on a podium. You need something that is going to fundamentally change people's lives. And that's your real difficulty. There are problems with the economy which are out of the government's control. But there are things you can do around the edges to make that better. You need to look at housing. So I think they need to settle on two or three things that they can get some results, they can put something forward which actually looks like they're making a difference and making some progress. If they don't do that, the infighting will continue, the party will split, the election is lost. Benedict. The problem is there is a level of distrust, I think, between the Conservative Party and its sort of core voters, the people that it would expect to vote. Um, I think it was very interesting that Claire just touched upon the idea of housing right there, because one of the things that most people can agree on is that the UK has terrible economic growth. One of the things that is putting a real handbrake on that is the lack of house building in this country. The problem is a lot of Conservative voters do not want more houses to be built, or at the very least, not near them. Of course, they need to be built somewhere, but it's very clear that they don't want them to be built near them. 
But that's where the houses need to be built, because that is the part of the country that is underserved by a lack of housing. So how on earth is it that you, as the Conservative government, say, we've got this fantastic policy, it's going to turbocharge growth, it's going to mean that your bills come down, it's going to mean more prosperity for all, but you aren't going to like it, because they are not going to vote for it. And that's actually a lot of what we've seen at the local elections, is people not turning out to vote for... Uh, Conservative uh, candidates, and a lot of them, especially when they go over to the Lib Dems, that's why you see the Lib Dems do very well at local levels, because Lib Dems are just as famous as the Tories are for not wanting to build new houses. So you've got a real disconnect there between the party that's going, what do we need? Economic growth. And it's voters that are going, no, we don't. No, absolutely we don't. That's not important to me at all. Perhaps somewhere else in another context, but the things that's actually going to cause growth, that's not important to me. Nick... If I were to say that um, the Conservatives seem to be looking through their roster of uh, generalised generalized issues that they typically do well on, well, you've got inflation and the economy. Uh, it's going to be a little bit tricky for them to sell. You start going through other things, sort of uh, handling of immigration, they're going to run into difficulties there. If you're the Conservative Party, what do you campaign on in the next election? Well I, I think it's it's quite quite interesting when you go through that beginnings of a list you were talking about. The one that is so far out and above everything else, including small boats, is the economy. And uh, and I, I agree with um, Claire, and I certainly wasn't saying this, that the idea uh, that if you dismiss these elections as, as, as by-elections and, and that voters will come out in a general election, you would be stupid. But actually, the most stupid thing is to forget that this next election will be about the economy. Everything depends on that, because it's not just so far out in the polls, but every problem you are trying to fix, or Rishi Sunak is trying to fix, is fundamentally comes down to him having a semblance of a, a, an economy. Um, the, the, the fact that it's included in his five pledges, which I, I have to say uh, was a highly questionable thing to do, but the fact that it's at the top of the list just shows you that the Conservatives' faith doesn't really lie in whether they're trying to build more houses, the economy again, as Benedict has explained, or whether they stop uh, the small votes. It lies in how this economy is going to perform over the next 12 months. And they don't have all the levers at their hand to pull it. So what have they got? They've got managerial technical competence, which is what they're arguing Rishi Sunak is. And in a way, Keir Starmer is trying to say, I'm the same thing. The thing, the ingredient that's missing to get voters coming out of the trenches and to back them is to remember that at general elections, people vote for hope. They hope for change. They vote for that things will get better. And neither Rishi Sunak or even Keir Starmer speak that language or show how, they, uh, how and why voting Conservative will give you that hope that things will be better for you. Benedict, uh, slightly controversially, um, mm. you mentioned earlier that uh, one of the reasons why the Conservatives did well, relatively speaking, in their Uxbridge by-election is because they focused on a very local issue. Mm. You also mentioned the Liberal Democrats, and there's a strange linkage going on, a rivalry between them at the moment uh, with the Conservative Party as well. The Liberal Democrats tend to focus on local issues. Yeah. Do you think the Conservatives need to go with the economy, as Nick has suggested, which is going to be a very tricky proposition, mm. given they've had 20% <coughs> inflation in the last 12 months, or do they go hyper-local? Is that another way to do it? Hyperlocalism is very dangerous simply because you don't know. Then it all comes down to sort of how people interpret or perceive their local MPs. Um, and even in those set of circumstances, people might just get into the ballot box and go, actually, no, I just fancy Keir Starmer. Um, the problem with the idea of the Tories then campaigning more broadly on the idea of the economy is their reputation on the economy has been absolutely shattered, courtesy of Liz Truss, uh, which is slightly unfair, slightly unfair. It was, you know, a lot about perceptions, but no doubt she has done a lot of damage. Um, she's sort of set the neoliberal agenda back in this country a good two generations. Uh, so you can't really, even though Rishi Sunak has this idea of being sort of very competent managerial type, broadly speaking, the Tory brand at a national level is toxified on this issue. So... That there might therefore be an argument to say, yes, it does need to be done on a localised level. But again, I then go back to things like house building. It's not just house building, it's also things like um, energy infrastructure, it's things like nuclear power stations, it's things like wind farms, it's things like reservoirs, you know, where are you going to get your water from? Again, we don't have any new reservoirs in this country because people vote against them. When you then try to offer them local things that might boost the local economy, it might make an area more attractive, 
you're in really dangerous territory because you don't know if that particular constituency is going to go, yes, I fancy me some prosperity, or if they're going to go, actually, I quite like things to say quiet and I don't want to be bothered, frankly. Because really, you get both of those in the Tory, in the Tory voting um, public. Claire. But also, there's, there's a real problem with being hyper-local. Now, the Liberal Democrats are very, very good at doing this, but also they're not the party in power. So they can almost promise the earth and don't have to deliver that because if they get elected, they're not in power and they can say, oh, well, the government of whichever colour has said we can't do it, but I'm here for you, I'm fighting for your reservoir, for your house, for your whatever it might be. The bathtub to be removed from the garden of house number 32. Absolutely. So they're, you know, it's never going to be their fault. So you have to, you have to sort of step back from that. And Benedict's right, you need much more sort of a national plan. If you're going to be a government, you can't concentrate on the needs of Kent versus the needs of Sunderland or the needs in Wales because they are going to be very, very different. Your demographic is different, your needs are different, there are different levels of local government that come in. So it's very, very hard to do that. So you need to come back to the very, very sort of specific things, as I said previously. To make it hyper-local, I think, would just lead to the country falling apart. OK, slightly different take on something that uh, Benedict was saying, which is he mentioned that the Tory brand has become toxic on certain issues. I'm going to go a little bit further and say, the Tory brand has just become toxic. If we were to look at uh, the BBC, the BBC might say something along the lines of blah, 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 and that was the Labour leader, Keir Starmer. Meanwhile, the Tory Prime Minister. He's never the leader of the Conservative Party. The Conservative Prime Minister, it's the Tory. But I think that is just down to the way that we all now communicate. If you go back to elections in 2010, and even as back as sort of 2005, you didn't have social media. 24-hour reporting was there, but it wasn't as apparent as it is nowadays. All the information is out there within nanoseconds of it coming through. So I think that we have to adapt. We have to adapt as a party, we have to adapt as politicians to that instant nature. And everybody is trying to be very careful about what they say, but sometimes you have to go out there and be bold because that piece of information will go out there and it's always the first piece of information is the one that does the rounds. So it doesn't matter what comes after it because it's already there and you need to be able to be ahead of the game. You need to be ahead of that narrative rather than on catch up the whole time. Nick, um, the word Tory, the use of the word Tory to describe the prime minister, to describe the party, is there a branding issue here? Do they need to find a new sort of marketing thing to attach to the Conservative Party as to what they stand for? No. no. No, it's all too late for that stuff. I mean, we're about we're about a year away from a, a general election and, and a bit more. But what you have identified very neatly is something that both Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer are doing, which is they're both busy trying to explain why they're not their predecessors, why they're not Boris Johnson, why they're not Liz Truss and so forth. And Keir Starmer's doing that. He's not Jeremy Corbyn and so forth. They are not really saying what they stand for. That's where Rishi Sunak can take risks. He's got absolutely nothing to lose by actually coming forward, being bold in, in, in not just in policies, but his ambition for the country. It's all he's got left. At the moment, he is still more popular than the Conservative Party. Only just, but he is. And that's one of the few uh, weapons that they've got in their arsenal. The route to victory for the Conservatives, which is extremely narrow, I'm sorry to say, is actually um, a combination, uh, if you like, of Rishi Sunak and the economy performing well, regardless of whether the Tories are blamed for it or not. Because that, if you like, will feed the motivation that there's hope for the future and Rishi Sunak is talking, talking the language. Keir Starmer, he obviously has, 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 will have a different game plan. Nick, slightly different tune, but I'm playing it on the same xylophone which is, have the Conservatives been in power too long? Are they devoid of ideas? You've mentioned there what uh, Rishi Sunak needs to do is he needs to come out with new sweeping policies, bold plans. What bold plans, what bold ideas, where are they going to draw these from? What direction do they take the country in? Well, I, I think they need, as I said right at the beginning, they need to understand, and they've got some very bright people in, in number 10, they need to understand what it was that kept those Conservatives at home. This was what I was saying at the beginning, because they deserted the Conservative Party 
for a number of reasons, uh, particularly in, uh, in, in, in the um, uh, two other seats outside of London. That, why did they stay at home? Answer those uh, uh, questions and you start to piece together what I would say is a much more conservative agenda. You have a chance of bringing them back or a larger number of them back because no one, unlike it was in 97 with Major and Blair, no one is particularly wedded to Keir Starmer. Uh, and, and in some ways, the benefit of Uxbridge is that it's kind of put the narrative and spotlight back on him a bit. So that's what they really need to do. Changing logos or coming up with some new brand sweeping statement, that's just all for the birds, right? Because no one's going to believe it. Um, what, they, what they will want to see is a clearly spelt out, well-defined agenda. And I'm afraid that includes some very um, uh, credible statements on crime, on law and order, on taxation and ambition, where you are going, on immigration and even on taking a sensible look at the green strategies, which are currently pricing, giving people pricing problems. Benedict, um, what would you advise the Conservatives right now? I would advise them to be bold. Uh, the word I'd actually use is muscular. What this government does not exude is any sort of confidence, uh, as well as not really having a sort of a coherent uh, vision of what it wants to be. It just it, it is behaving like a party in opposition already. What I think a lot of Conservative voters would like to see is just confidence. And that doesn't sound like a great deal. But if you believe that the government itself believes in its own policies and that it does plan to see them through, I think that is enough to really G up a lot of people who might stay at home. I think where the party needs to look, I know it's very polarising, but they do need to look at why it is that this current situation they're in is quite so traumatic. It's because they won a large majority at the last, last general election. Why did that ha happen? Because Boris Johnson promised them lots of different things. Now, some people might say that they weren't achievable, but he had a vision. That's the idea. And it wasn't just about getting Brexit done. There were all the other, you know, big ticket items that he was promising about marrying, you know, if you like, uh, traditional left wing voters in sort of left behind seats with a um, more, more modern vo version of Toryism. There was a future for that. The problem is, of course, it was Boris Johnson at the helm, so it was always unlikely to unravel. But if there were to, if, if the party were to sort of revert back to that idea about taking back control, and as Nick says, you know, focus on things that are achievable. Crime, very low-level crime, can be nipped in the bud, makes a huge difference to people's lives. Things like energy policy, actually getting ahead and saying, we're going to build some nuclear power stations, we're going to do these things. We're not going to do, you know, incredible you know, things that are going to bankrupt the country, but you are going to see tangible progress in the next 12 months. Just that might be enough to just change the feeling amongst Tory voters, just to get them to come out and vote. Because at the moment, that's the key thing. It's not that they're going to go over to Labour right now. Nobody's that enamoured with Keir Starmer. It is simply that there is apathy within the party. And if your party's not giving you any kind of confidence, well, why would you go out and vote for it? Claire, let me cover this from the other direction. Keir Starmer, do you think he's playing this well? Or do you think he's playing this, uh, if you like, uh, too cautiously? Because he is essentially just keeping quiet and waiting for the Tories to implode on their own, isn't he? He is, and there is some kind of credibility to that. If you are in opposition, sometimes the less you can do, the better, and you let the government of the day make those problems stand up there and have all the issues. But... It's risky. It is risky, and as Benedict said, there is nothing that the voters are seeing from Keir Starmer that says, well, actually, that's the man. And there is your major difference between what happened in 97 with the Labour Party under Tony Blair. They looked like a government in waiting. They had ideas. They had uh, fresh people coming through. They had some talent, you know, whether you like it or not. But the Keir Starmer front bench, shadow front bench doesn't have that. They don't look in any way coalescing around some points that would go out to the voters and say, vote for us, look at us, aren't we brilliant? At the moment, they're just saying, we're better than the Conservative Party, and then they're just staying quiet. And the voters need more than that to make a decision. Nick, very quickly, because we're running out of time here, uh, what do you think of Keir Starmer's position at the moment? Do, is he, does he have that air of a government in waiting? No, no, he most definitely doesn't, and that's the opportunity for the Conservatives. If he did... Um, I, I think you would have, he would have still won Uxbridge. If he did, I think um, you, would have, you, you would have seen actually a surge in confidence um, from the Labour Party that they're, they're going to be a party in office. It's very skin deep, as, uh, as has, has already been said. He, to, to my mind, he's, he's actually the Conservatives' greatest strength in many ways at the moment, only if they're bold enough to seize the initiative and fight uh, for being in government next time round. 
Well, Nick, Claire, Benedict, thank you very much, all three of you, for joining me today. I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but you can see more discussion and debate if you head on over to our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me here and all of the team, thank you for watching and goodbye.